Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Investigating the Capacitor Self Balancing in a Flying Capacitor Bug Converter. There is a relevant video to this presentation, intuitive explanation of a flying capacitor three level bug converter. Here's the link to this video, and I'm going to print this information in the description section of the video that you are now watching. Now, a three level bug converter is shown here. This is promoted by Texas Instrument. This picture is taken from this uh, application node. This is the number of this application node. Maximize power density with three level buck switching charger. And the three level is supposed to reduce, the objective is to reduce the switching losses, to lower the switching losses. And this is done by reducing the MOSFET voltage and lowering the inductor ripple. By doing this, you can reduce the switching losses. And it is accomplished by reducing the voltage on the MOSFET when it is off. That is, when the transistor is off, it doesn't see V in, but rather V in over 2. two. So the swing between off and on is not V in, but V in over 2. And this is accomplished by the flying capacity, as we've seen. So here is how it works. Again, this picture is from the application notes of Texas Instrument. Now, as it turns out, the mode of operation is different for duty cycles smaller than 0.5 and larger than. So we have here actually four stages, and these are obtained by switching, of course, the transistor in a different way. Let me start from here. And here we see this transistor is on, and then this transistor is on. So we are fitting the voltage of the capacitor to this uh, network here, the output network. And here it is, we see V in over 2 at the midpoint. And then we have this uh, short period, which is uh, like an asynchronous buck converter. And then we move to the other phase in which we have now V in minus the voltage on the capacitor fed to the input. Again, V in minus V in over 2 is again V in over 2. So we are feeding pulses of the same height during T off it's zero so it sort of behaves like a buck converter but now look at the voltage across transistors when they are off let's have a look at this one okay here it's v in because this transistor is on here it's connected to the capacitor the other side so it's v in over two now let's have a look at this one Again, it's V in minus the capacitor voltage, V in over 2. So here again, we have again V in over 2. You can do it for all the transistor. So in proper operation, steady state, the voltage on the transistor when they are off is V in over 2, which is very nice. Then you can select transistor with lower voltage and the RDS on will be lower. So this is very nice. And the swing is also only V in over 2, so switching MOSFETs are lower. So this is for D smaller than 0.5. For D larger than 0.5, it, it's similar, except for the fact that there is no zero voltage, but rather V in over 2. That is, what the system is doing is generating either V in over 2, this is the capacitor, or V in. Here, this is V in. So the swing is again V in over 2, but the pulse now is higher. So now you can get output which are larger than V in over 2. So we understand that for proper operation, the voltage on the flying capacitor needs to be equal to V in over 2. That's fine. But the question is, is the voltage self-balancing? That if, if there is a deviation, will it come back to V in over 2, or there is a need for... A controller. Now this is exactly what I'm going to explore in this uh, presentation. I'm making the assumption that the output capacitor ripple voltage is small so that it can be neglected and assumed like a, a DC source. Okay, this is just to simplify things. So in order to understand the issue of self-balancing, we need to see what are the circuits involved in the modes when the capacitor is charged or discharged. So we have actually two modes. Let's have a look first of it. This one, the simple one. In here, we are feeding the voltage of the capacitor to the output section. 
while here it's V in minus the capacitor fed to the output. So we can represent these as two equivalent circuits. This is for this phase here, the, in, the capacitor fed to the output, and then in this phase, we have V in minus the capacitor voltage fed to the input. Now, in the two cases, of course, the voltage here will be V in over 2, V in over 2. And we would expect then this voltage sort of to, to taper off as the capacitor is being discharged here and here. And then the current will build up. I'm showing here a negative current. I'm considering current into the capacitor, into the plus as positive. So this is discharging the capacitor, this current here. And this current now is charging the capacitor. So we have a discharging and charging. The currents are the same, polarity are, are opposite. So net, there is no charging or discharging of the capacitor. So there is no question that this is a stable situation. But the question is, if the capacitor voltage is not V in over two, and I'm considering in the case that it is smaller than V in over two, what will happen? What will be the tendency? Is it going to sort of self-balance or run away? So what happens here is that I have one pulse which is lower than the other one. Consequently, the current here is smaller. The total charge, you might say here, is smaller than the total, total charge here. So the net is a charge which is actually correcting the situation. That is here, the charge is much higher, so the capacitor will be actually charged, while here it will not be that discharged at that fast. So it will be charged and not discharged, and consequently, eventually, it will correct. So this is the situation that you'd expect and are going to explore it by uh, simulation later on. But there are some limitations that we have to take into account. First of all, the inductor. If the inductor is very large, the current is almost constant. So it doesn't matter if the capacitor is V in over 2 or not, the current will be about the same. Eventually, it might uh, self-balance because there will be a very small difference. It might take just too long. So there is a problem here. Also, the same thing goes for the flying capacitor uh, capacitance. If it is very large, then it will take a long time to charge or discharge to correct it. And then there is also an issue with the output capacitor size. If uh, it is a small capacitance, then there will be a high ripple, and the ripple on the flying capacitor might be lower. And then there is the issue of startup. At the beginning, the voltage of the capacitor is zero, and there might be a problem with the maximum voltage on the transistor, which would be larger than uh, V in over 2. So there is a need for sort of a startup sequence, which I'm not going to discuss in this uh, presentation, but it is very important. So to explore the actual more practical behavior of uh, this uh, converter, I've set up an LTSPI schematic. I'm using here four switches. This is the flying capacitor. I'm representing it as a capacitor plus a series voltage source. In fact, this is the assembly here is like a charge capacitor. From outside, it looks like a charge capacitor. And the reason that I'm doing it is that I want to change the voltage across the capacitor. This is across the whole thing. And this is done by having this as a pulse source with a voltage of 12.5 volt, which is half this 25, V in over 2, and then it, at 3 milliseconds it will jump to 15 volt. So we can see whether the system will be able to self-balance from this disturbance, okay? And then I have these switches which are fed by these uh, pulses coming from this uh, pulse generators here, the two pulses here. And the duty cycle is uh, like 0.3 of the whole 10 microseconds, 100 kilohertz switching frequency. Now, in order to simplify things, rather than turning these two together for the short here that we need during the off time, I've put here a diode. So this also helps not to leave this uh, 
point here disconnected and then there will be a problem with this inductor if you disconnect it here from anything. So this is just to simplify thing, to simplify the drive of these uh, switches. And here is the typical result. I, this is the inductor current, this is the midpoint, and this is the capacitor current. And this is running to 20 milliseconds as and then at three milliseconds, we have this uh, jump between 12.5 volt to 15 volt. So at the beginning, there is a disturbance here, of course, because the capacitor is zero and then it has to adjust itself. So let's not worry about it. This is not the subject matter of this presentation. And I'm first going to show what is the situation after one millisecond. This is here, here, oh, and here. And here it is. We see here the midpoint, we see the two pulses were already the same. It's already self-balanced. This is the inductor current, and this is the capacitor current. We see here these spikes, high spikes, which are parasitic spikes due to the capacitance of the diode. Here is the diode, and then when the voltage at the midpoint is switched on, then there is a current through this capacitance of this Schottky diode. And this, these are the spikes that we see, but they are really very narrow spikes, so let's not worry about that. So to see what is really happening, I'm zooming into this plot here. And here it is. So we see that at one millisecond, it's already balanced. The current of the capacitor is symmetrical, plus and minus looks the same, exactly as you'd expect. We see the current rising, everything is fine. So there's no question about this, that this works very nice and it's already balanced. Now at three milliseconds, we have this disturbance. Up to three milliseconds, it's balanced. And then it went to 15 volt. So it's unbalanced. We see this uh, voltage is different here, of course. And then also the current is, has different shapes. So there is a net current of that is charging the capacitor. And this process is helping to balance the capacitor to bring it back to V in over two. And indeed, after 15 milliseconds, you see it's already back to the symmetrical operation. Current is the same, everything is okay. So we see that in this situation, the system is really capable of adjusting itself. Now, if I'm doing some changes here, for example, reducing the output capacitance and what is very important here, I am increasing the inductance of the inductor to 100 microhenry. In this case, the current of the inductor is with very little ripple, so it's almost constant. And consequently, the currents of the capacitor are just about constant, but there's a very little slope here and slope here. So when the capacitor voltage is not V in over two, so it's asymmetrical, then it'll take a long time for it to balance out because the difference here is very, very small. And here we see that already at 20 millisecond, after the three millisecond jump, it's still unbalanced and it'll probably take a few seconds uh, to balance out. So this becomes a problem. But all the above is assuming that the T on time of the two phases is exactly the same. Now this is not realistic, of course, and you'd expect some changes between one pulse and the other, the A and the B pulses. This is the A and the B. And to test this, what I did, I've changed one of the pulses. A, you can't see, you can't see it because the change is very small instead of three microseconds, it's 2.95. So it's about five in 300, a little bit more than 1%. This is the difference between the width of the pulses here. And here you see that the whole thing collapses. Midpoint voltage is really asymmetrical completely. This died out and then the currents are really asymmetrical. Well, why is this? Well, the reason is that even a small change could be a significant charging or discharging current. 
because 1%, if the current of the inductor is, say, uh, 2 amp, 1% of 2 amp is a lot, and the capacitor is now being continuously charged. So you need a very large change in the capacitor voltage to correct it. Such a change is impossible. So it sort of clamps down. And this is correct for changing A, and if I'm changing B, I see the same picture. So you see that although when the T on of the two phases is exactly the same, the thing is still balancing, from the practical point of view, there is a big problem here, because you cannot be assured to have exactly the same T on on the two phases, not to mention the problem of uh, noises, which will corrupt the rise time of one phase as compared to the other one. So what is the conclusion here? The three-level flying capacitor back converter has a theoretical ability to self-balance. There's no question about that. But in practice, using a balancing control is almost mandatory. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.